Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the uh, on the uh, mental, mental health benefits in the workplace. My name is Terry Schwartzbeck. I'm the Director of Strategic uh, Public Engagement and Community Outreach here at the American Psychological Association, and I'm so glad you all are joining us today. We hope that by the end of our time together, you'll come away with some ideas of things that you can better do to support employee wellness in the workplace. Today, I am so glad to be joined by some wonderful guests who I really appreciate joining us today. The first is uh, David Lloyd, who is, sorry, my screen keeps messing up, my Chief Policy Officer at the Kennedy Forum, and Elise Schumann, Senior Vice President of Health Policy at the American Benefits Council. I'd also really like to welcome all of you. I'm so glad that you all have joined us today and invite you to share a little bit about yourself in the chat so we know a little bit more about who's here. Please take a moment to share where you work and your role. We're here today to talk about how employers and employees uh, can best support their employees' mental health. We know this is an incredibly important factor for individuals as they make future job decisions or choose to stay in their roles. If you're an employer, you're here because you've seen how important this is to your productivity, to maintaining a good staff, to keeping good people. And you've also probably experienced it both personally and directly. You also probably know that making sure that getting access to care for your employees can be challenging, as can be navigating the rules and regulations around mental health care. And that's why we've brought together this panel of experts to give you real world advice on making sure your employees get what they need. Uh, with that said, I'd like to start with Elise. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, first question for you, Elise, how important is it for employers to provide high quality mental health benefits? Um, tell us a little bit about the American Benefits Council, where you work and what you're seeing on this issue. Okay, well, well, thank you so much. I'm so happy to, to be here to talk to you all today. I'm from the American Benefits Council. We are an association that represents large nationwide employers that offer uh, benefits to their employees. Uh, we represent over 220 of the world's largest uh, companies. And let me just say that mental health and specifically expanding access to mental health is a top priority for employers and for our member companies. In fact, we did a, a poll recently and ask them about you know, a host of, of different uh, policy priorities for their organization and expanding access to mental health was the top priority for 90% of them. And, and I think that's a reflection of certainly coming out of the pandemic and, um, and, and just you know, challenges in trying to keep employees and their families healthy, both physically and mentally. And sure, you know, sharing many of the frustrations and concerns about, you know, the the greater need for mental health care and challenges in, in accessing that care. So I'm so happy to be here to talk about at least some of the experience we have from our member companies about how to address those challenges. And let me just say, I just want to put a finer point, an exclamation point on Terry, that you something that you said. And that is why is this important for employers? Because employers do recognize how critical mental health, the mental health and well-being of their workforce is to productivity um, and the health of their workforce. And they also realize that it actually, the mental health, because so many comorbidities occur with mental health and physical health, that there's a real association between mental health and physical health as well, too. And that's why, again, it's one of the top priorities for so many employer organizations, and they are on the front line of combating the mental health crisis. Thank you so much, Elise. Um, David, I'd like to turn to you now. We, um, as we've uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, one thing that really influences the way that mental health benefits are provided is something called the mental health parity law. David, can you share with us just a little bit about the Kennedy Forum, what you do, and tell us a little bit about the parity law and what it means? Sure, happy to, and uh, thank you for having me uh, today. Um, so the Kennedy Forum was founded uh, 10 years ago by uh, Patrick and Amy Kennedy. 
Um, Patrick Kennedy is author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008 when he was in Congress, um, which is uh, the, the federal anti-discrimination you know, law governing mental health and addiction uh, coverage. And so the Federal Parity Act is really the foundational law, you know, uh, you know on uh, mental health and addiction coverage and basically says that um, uh, Americans in plans that are subject to the act um, are entitled to mental health and addiction coverage um, that's comparable um, and equitable to what they receive uh, in terms of physical health coverage. So essentially the idea um, and the requirements are that, you know, mental health and addiction coverage um, you know, should be uh, comparable to uh, physical health coverage. And so the, the law um, you know, outlawed um, you know, separate deductibles, um, you know, got rid of uh, things like uh, you know, annual caps um, on, on benefits. It also uh, puts in place requirements relating to co-payments and cost sharing uh, have to be made equitable, um, but also very importantly, um, you know, treatment limitations on uh, treatment, um, what are often called non-quantitative treatment limitations, um, like prior authorization, those have to be comparable and uh, no more uh, restrictive on mental health or addiction benefits than on physical health benefits. So, you know, at, at the basic idea is that it's, uh, you know, sets kind of a level playing field for uh, mental health and addiction coverage, um, but there's still ways to go to make sure that, uh, you know, we're realizing uh, the promise uh, of the law, which you know, look forward to discussing uh, today. But you know, it's had an important effect um, in terms of helping get people uh, the care they need. But uh, obviously, we, must, we need to go much further, uh, both uh, you know, from both in the employer sector, uh, but also through things like the Affordable Care Act um, and uh, other other payers as well. So I uh, look forward to having this discussion. And thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, David. And uh, you know, you you touched on this a little, um, but what are some challenges uh, that organizations might face in um, trying to provide these mental health benefits in a manner both that meets the letter and the spirit of this law? Um, at least, do you want to start with that, and then David, I'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah, so so sure. Let me um, maybe talk a little bit more granularly about the the mental health parity um, requirements and some of the compliance challenges, but really also want to take a step back and look at that in the in the broader context of employer efforts to try to to combat mental health and some of the the mental health crisis and some of the challenges that they face. So you know, our employer member companies, you know, we hear from them repeatedly about their commitment to mental health parity, to the obligations that, that David was talking about under MAPIA. Um, I think that the, the, the challenge is not with complying with the spirit of the law, but actually what compliance with the mental health parity obligations actually look like, um, and specifically with respect to those non-quantitative treatment limits that, that David was talking about, you know, prior authorization, concurrent review, um, standards for, you know, provider admission into networks, you know, out-of-network reimbursement rates, and and a requirement specifically included in uh, the Congressional Appropriations Act of 2021, requiring that this comparative analysis be done by plans and not being really clear about what compliance with this sort of very technical comparative analysis looks like. And I would say that on a compliance standpoint, that has been the biggest challenge for our employer uh, plans is sort of figuring out and trying to get into the mind of the regulators about what this comparative analysis actually looks like. And so, you know, we have been advocating for just some clear guidance and direction from the Department of Labor about, okay, just tell us what compliance looks like, not what non-compliance looks like, but, you know, what it looks like to actually 
be in compliance with these requirements and some examples and, and checklists and good questions to ask. And, and maybe just taking a step back at, you know, the bigger issue, you know, when we look at, you know, mental health parity and, and challenges, the comparative analysis and whether a checklist is right or wrong. I mean, when, when you take a step back and from the, you know, employer perspective, they want to make sure that their employees and their employees' families have access to quality, affordable mental health care when they need it. And so I think there is a bigger issue, bigger frustration about challenges in access to, you know, to care and, and a shortage of providers and, and challenges again in, in access to care. And when you have, you know, I think, you know, like a third of the country in a mental health desert, that's a real issue. And so I think we, when we talk about mental health parity and compliance with mental health parity, we at the same time need to be talking about how we can fight the bigger battle in which that operates. Absolutely, that is so important. And I know we are all um, seeing that challenge with access to care. Uh, David, did you, wanna, did you wanna share some about what you're seeing? Yeah, so you know, you know, I think as uh, you know, at least uh, mentioned, um, there are relatively new in the last couple of years requirements uh, that uh, health plans conduct these parity compliance analyses of their non-quantitative treatment limitations, and essentially that's how they uh, how they limit um, mental health and addiction uh, coverage and making sure that that's equitable um, for mental health and addiction benefits versus uh, medical surgical. Uh, benefits and those are new rules. And so prior to that, essentially there was no requirement that health plans demonstrate that they were in compliance. And so that has been, you know, the lack of those rules up until that point was actually, um, you know, made uh, ensuring compliance a real a real challenge. Um, so you know those uh, those new requirements I think are very foundational. They're actually written into the statute um, in terms of what plans you know, have to do to demonstrate uh, compliance. And, you know, the Parity Act doesn't prescribe um, specific types of benefit design, uh, which I think is actually pretty important. So plans have a lot of flexibility in how they design benefits. And essentially the compliance analyses are saying, you have flexibility to design benefits. Now you have to actually show that how you've designed those benefits um, and built in the treatment limitations, you know, as part of those benefits uh, that they comply with the law. So that has actually made it, um, you know, plans, uh, it's, it, the regulators really can't say with great specificity, this is what the analysis has to contain because, you know, the benefit design is, you know, particular to any given plan. Um, so I think that that has been, um, as we've been kind of working over the last couple of years, that has been kind of a challenge of making sure that given how the benefits are designed, um, that the compliance analyses um, are actually showing, uh, showing that uh, you know, plans are in fact uh, compliance, because at the end of the day, that's a critical component of making sure uh, that uh, you know, employees and their families uh, you know, have, have access. But certainly, you know, there are other issues in addition to the Federal Parity Act um, that are relevant that at least uh, you know, touched on you know, workforce is a big issue. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think what everyone wants to see is that, uh, you know, all Americans and, you know, certainly uh, employees uh, in employer-sponsored health plans, you know, are able to access the mental health and addiction services that they need. Um, I know we'll touch on this a little bit more, but, uh, you know, that's so important to our overall, you know, businesses, like overall success and, you know, the success of our, um, you know, overall economy and, and, frankly, the strength of our country. Um, you know, making sure that people have access to the services they need. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you hit on something really important there, David, which is this isn't just about employees themselves, but employees and their families. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've all seen that uh, if an employee is dealing with um, a challenge within their family, that also can have just a tremendous impact on that employee in the workplace. They're dealing with the stress of uh, being a caregiver or finding care or, or processing and taking care of um, getting, getting that coverage. Um, so I want to talk a little bit or ask a little bit about what are some things employers are doing as they are attempting to provide access to this mental health coverage. Um, 
whether or not they know for sure if it's in compliance. I know one of those ways is through their actual health care benefits plans. Um, another way that employers provide access is through um, employee assistant plans or EAPs. Um, did you want to talk about some of the solutions that um, employers are using to make sure they're providing this care? Elise, looks like you want to jump in. Sure. So, and, and let me just say that I think the first thing and one of the most important foundational things employers can do is communicate about the, the availability of these resources, removing the stigma about accessing, about needing help for mental health care, and you know, in repeated communications to let their employees know that there are resources for their employees and for their families to turn to. And, and so I think when we look at our employers who have had success and really taking on you know, the, the mental health crisis challenge, I think it starts with communication. And again, and I think that is really a unique role that employers can play in trying to remove the stigma around saying, I need help and help me find out where I could get that help. And, you know, and I think that as far as some of the, some of the steps that, um, employers and our member companies have taken, you know, during the pandemic. And I, I think even, um, you know, can, continuing now is, you know, figuring out innovative ways to make sure that employees can access the care they need. Um, in many ways, they turn to telehealth as a way to try to expand access to, you know, a mental health provider um, to, you know, to the, to, to get care from a provider via telehealth, um, you know, and not only because, you know, I mentioned some of those those deserts, those mental health deserts, but also finding that, um, you know, some employees, particularly in like smaller, you know, localities maybe were concerned about seeing, being walking, walking into a therapist's office. And so, um, or having to take time off work, you know, so I think that, so I think that telehealth really was such a lifeline to care during the pandemic. And I think as we see in terms of behavioral health, it's a lifeline gonna continue. And, and just to put in a plug for a specific policy, um, policy issue that's a real priority for us. And for those of you um, who offer um, health savings account eligible, high deductible health plans, there was uh, a provision, there was some flexibility that was provided originally in some of the uh, COVID relief packages that would allow employers the flexibility to offer pre-deductible coverage for telehealth, um, meaning that, you know, you if you had an HSA eligible high deductible health plan, you could access telehealth um, before meeting your deductible, making telehealth and telebehavioral health then more affordable and accessible for you. Um, Congress just recently extended that provision for another two years. We think that's great because telehealth again is a real key to um, unlocking greater access to telehealth. But you know that's going to expire, so we're already working on 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 trying to make that permanent. I think you know also thinking about what are the other. Um, impediments in accessing and really leveraging telehealth um, to try to expand access to behavioral health care. And also, you know, Terry, you mentioned employee assistance programs. And I think employers have, have really, during the pandemic, and a lot of these we highlighted in something called our Silver Linings Playbook, really tried to take EAPs to the next level too, and sort of figuring out, you know, new solutions. Um, oftentimes outside of, or sometimes outside of their sort of bigger um, healthcare plans to be able to make sure that, you know, employees can get access to speedy, um, you know, the, the speedy behavioral health care that they need. So I think a lot of that, that playbook that employers turn to, they're continuing to turn to, and we are certainly advocating for a continuation of policies that support those efforts. Absolutely. Um, David, what is your sense on um, the way, some of the successful ways that employers have been able to um, work towards providing this, this positive environment around mental health care and access? 
Yeah, it, it, certainly, you know, we are in the middle of a mental health and addiction crisis in, in this country, and so employers do play such an essential role um, in, you know, helping address that crisis. Um, you know, I think it's really important for employers that are providing, you know, health coverage um, to really be, uh, you know, good stewards and effective consumers on behalf of their employees uh, and their families. Um, they're uh, purchasing health benefits um, as part of the overall benefits package, and knowing what they're purchasing is really critical. And you know, knowing uh, that there's an adequate network, you know, knowing uh, that uh, covered benefits are, um, you know, extensive enough to meet, uh, you know, their employees' and needs. Um, and, you know, employers have a lot of, uh, have a lot of power in many instances um, to actually help construct, um, you know, benefits, uh, you know, in particular when they're working in a self-funded context uh, and, and hiring a third-party administrator um, to really insist that, uh, you know, certain key elements for that uh, you know, coverage uh, be in place. Um, and, you know, so by being, uh, you know, smart purchasers of health uh, coverage, um, they can really uh, you know, be, uh, you know, powerful advocates, uh, you know, for their employees and also ultimately for their, you know, underlying uh, uh, business um, imperatives of, you know, having a productive uh, workforce. But, you know, I think that's really critical um, is employers uh, being effective consumers and knowing what they're, knowing what they're purchasing and, and knowing that their third party administrator uh, is really uh, taking the steps they need uh, to ensure compliance with the federal period. Yeah. And just to dig a little bit deeper into that, <coughs> David, um, are there and I, we had, this is a new question here, but like, are there resources that we can provide or are there examples of questions that provide uh, that employers can be asking? Is that something that has been um, that can be made available maybe to some of the folks on this call? Um, think, what types of questions should they be asking? Yeah, you know, I think it's important, uh, you know, to ask questions and actually uh, have the third party minister collect data, um, you know, on what uh, coverage looks like in practice. Uh, you know, data um, is what all organizations, including businesses, should be relying on to know what's actually uh, happening and being able to measure, um, you know, measure progress. Um, so I think that data collection uh, is key. Um, there are initiatives uh, like there's the Path Forward, um, which is an initiative among uh, purchasers. Um, and there are things like they have a model data request form uh, that employers can use uh, you know, to request information from, uh, you know, on their health coverage um, from their third party administrators. So that's, you know, that's really key. Um, you know, one thing that we uh, don't care, care deeply about um, are ensuring that the entire continuum of care, you know, is covered, um, and you know, for mental health and substance use disorders, well, specifically for substance use disorders, like the ACM uh, criteria from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, you know, lays out like what that continuum of care looks like. So certainly, something that employers could insist upon is that that whole continuum be covered services, and that you're relying on things like the ACM criteria. Um, to make those level of care determinations so that, you know, those determinations are really based on uh, their employees and their family members, you know, best interests. So there are a number of uh, different initiatives going on uh, that, uh, you know, I think can be, can be helpful, but, you know, certainly even surveying and asking questions uh, from your employees, I think can be, you know, very important and hearing about whether they feel like they can access care. And if they can't, like if you don't have, if the network is not big enough for mental health and addiction services, then you know it, it, employers uh, can really play a role in you know helping to uh, beef up that network. And in some instances, that frankly may mean increasing reimbursement rates for behavioral health providers to attract them to come into the the plan network. Um, you know, so that there is that uh, that access. Um, obviously, there is an issue with not having enough providers overall, um, but reimbursement rates are also critical um, to addressing that long-term uh, problem as well. So uh, definitely you know, be informed consumers, you know, ask questions, make sure that the, any third-party minister administrator is doing uh, the parity compliance analyses. Um, all of these are very important uh, questions to be asking. 
And so it's come up now a few times, and I've seen some of this in the chat around the issue of, um, at least I think you mentioned that a third of the country is in a mental health care desert, that we have rural places. We have somebody in North Dakota mentioning there's a lack of providers in their areas. Mm -hmm. um, at least have you seen, I, we've mentioned telehealth. Are there other ways um, that we have found to help address these sort of mental health care deserts and, and rural places? Well, you know, I, I think I, I will say that, you know, telehealth has really, again, you know, been one of the most important tools that, you know, employers have, have had. But I think they're also, you know, looking to see what are, whether it's an EAP, whether there's, you know, other sort of ways to try to triage and at least get some care to employees that that don't have a behavioral health provider, you know, in their city or down the street or in their town. And I think that's a big, I think that's a big issue. I'll also say that, you know, there has been a focus on trying to integrate this a little bit more with uh, primary care. And so you've got other providers that are maybe spotting issues um, and maybe, I mean, we know that there's, there's a shortage of primary care providers too. So I think employers are really trying to look at a whole lot of different ways, whether it's, you know, through EAP offerings, whether it's through telehealth, whether it's through more of a, you know, an integrated, you know, integrating this more with, you know, primary care and other providers just to try to be able to spot the issues and say, hey, you know, we hear that you've got an issue and let's try to connect you in some way or another with the care that you need, you know, right now. Yeah, and, and I would just echo that. I mean, that's the care integration is critical. Um, many common mental health and substance use challenges can be effectively treated at the primary care level, um, you know, with, with integration. And it's also critical at the primary care level to have screening and measurement-based care um, so that we're actually identifying problems early. If we're um, if that's not occurring, you know, too often we are identifying things at stage four, which makes it very difficult, uh, you know, both from the individual's uh, you know, uh, uh, outcomes for the individual, um, but also in terms of costs, um, you know, when we're catching things, uh, you know, later on, uh, you know, in the illness, um, it's it's very important that we uh, move upstream uh, you know, towards early early identification uh, and treatment. Absolutely. And, you know, a big part of addressing problems early before they become more serious is encouraging, making sure that employees um, engage in health seeking behaviors when they, as soon as they feel the need. And a big part of that is uh, the stigma, um, right? People sometimes uh, don't even, you know, we've, I've heard from um, some EAP providers that they feel like, or from companies that we have this EAP or we have these benefits and people aren't taking advantage of it in part because they're concerned um, about some kind of stigma. Um, Dave, can, can you talk a little bit about kind of what you're seeing around stigma? Is that getting better? Are people seeking this? Or at least if you wanted to jump in as well. Well, let me just maybe just jump in just to, to say again from the, the employer perspective, because I, I made a comment about how critical that communication and the focus on removing the stigma was. And maybe, you know, this was a... Sh a bright light in the otherwise dismal pandemic was that, you know, it did bring out so many of the mental health issues that so many millions of people are facing. And, you know, and I've heard, you know, stories and I've seen, I mean, we all have our own personal stories, but, you know, also reports of, you know, some of our members, the CEO of the company being very frank and open about, you know, mental health you know, issues and substance abuse issues in his whole family and sort of communicating that, you know, employee wide and, you know, communicating to supervisors, for example, about, okay, these are the sort of things that you may need to be sort of on the lookout for. So there's a whole lot of different levers, I think, that employers have as sort of a trusted source and resource for you know, for, for healthcare and, and other issues that really put them in a very important position of trust to so many. And, and I think, you know, um, you know, I talked about uh, 
mental health being a top priority for you know 90% of our own employer organizations and and some surveys that i've seen from sort of the employee perspective is that it's also that high too so you know it's employers are hearing from their employees about how important this is and 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 also you know their frustrations with not being able to to access care David? Yeah, I mean, I just echo what what Elise said. Um, you know, it's uh, you know, they're, they're critically important uh, issues, and you know, a lot of a lot of it's setting the right uh, tone internally, having a culture that uh, is open about mental health uh, and addiction conversations, normalizing those conversations, um, and a lot of that starts at the top. Um, I think people are pretty good at, um, you know, employees are pretty good at. Uh, sensing whether um, you know, whether it's okay for them to be open, and if it's mm -hmm. and if they sense that it's not okay and there'll be repercussions, they oftentimes won't be open. Where if they, if they feel like it's a safe sp safe space to be open um, about challenges they or their family members may be having, um, you know that's that's really critical is creating that that environment. Um, but I do think we're making a lot of progress in terms of. Uh, in reducing stigma and uh, you know, discrimination. Um, and I think that will continue to get better. There's a lot of folk, particularly with younger generations, uh, and being very open uh, about uh, you know, mental health and you know, having just that be a part of everyday conversations. Absolutely. I think we're finding that there are probably some generational differences when it comes to um, seeking help. And I, I don't know what the stats are on that, but I hope that's something that uh, continues to grow. Um, I just wanted to touch really quickly, um, just a little bit more on the um, on the communications piece of it. It sounds to me like the internal communications within the organization and how this information is um, shared with employees can be really important. At least I recall in some of our earlier conversations, you mentioned how um, a CEO put it in his email signature, for example. Yeah. Um, can you share some of the other ways that maybe um, organizations are getting this information out? And I'll just add, we have, you know, we have organizations on this call that are both large companies and very small. So any suggestions there? Well, well, as you know, the, the example that you cited, you know, it coming from the top, I, I do think that, that that message from the CEO, that message from, you know, senior leadership at a company about, um, you know, the, the importance of, you know, identifying and seeking care for mental and, you know, and, and behavioral health needs is so important. Um, you know, and it's also really embedded in so many of the communications around benefit offerings to make sure that employees know that there is an employee assistance program and, and how to access that. Um, so I think that the, the sort of regular channels through which employees are communicated on benefit offerings, you know, that's a sort of an existing platform you know, whether it's just like a one line about, you know, here's the EAP and here's a number or, you know, a, um, you know, to call, um, you know, so they keep seeing this and they keep seeing this repeatedly. And, you know, and we did have, I, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, you know, some of our your more innovative employers talked about, you know, training that they did sort of like train the trainers, you know, training supervisors, training folks in their, you know, HR and benefits department about sort of how to spot where there might be some, you know, unmet mental health or behavioral health needs to, you know, obviously being very sensitive to, to privacy issues, but just, you know, like letting them know that, you know, that it's okay. And, you know, here's resources to direct you to. So I think it really comes, you know, from the top, from the very top, you know, from supervisors and just really embedding it into some of your just regular communications about with your employees about their benefits and other issues. Great, thank you. Well, we've gotten some uh, great questions coming into the Q&A, so I'd love to turn to some of those real quick. Um, one question comes in, um, 
employers and human resource staff are busy, right? Like we all know this, they are particularly busy in these times. Um, what might be just an example to kind of break things down, make it a little more manageable. What's like one thing an employer could do next six months to improve mental health care? Uh, David, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the network adequacy, you know, the, having a strong network is really key. Um, and so making sure that um, the health insurance plan um, uh, you know, has, a, has a robust network and that those, uh, that th those providers are actually available uh, to see patients. Um, unfortunately, too often, uh, people are given, you know, people have a list of you know, 10 or 20 or sometimes even I hear stories of people con trying to contract 100 providers, none of whom have access. So um, really drilling down into the access that your employees actually have um, is really key. And knowing um, how long people are having to wait for services, um, is there timely access? And if there's not timely access, does your health plan, are they arranging the network exceptions? Um, in order for the, um, in, you know, in order for the uh, employee or the family member to go to an out of network, uh, out of network provider, because ultimately the day it's about ensuring that people have access to the services, and if there's not that adequate network, um, it really makes uh, the promised benefits um, somewhat of an illusion, uh, you know, for the uh, enrollee, because that's what ultimately matters is whether they can access. Care. So, you know, I think that that uh, network adequacy and, you know, having a really robust network is critically important. Absolutely. Elise, what about you? What's one thing somebody could do in the next six months? Well, well I, I will say on that point, you know, I, I think that uh, employers are customers, consumers, they're clients, right? So they're clients of their, their health plans. And so I think they are very, they are very well situated to ask those important questions to say, look, you know, what are you doing to, um, you know, what does your network look like? What are you doing to expand your, you know, providers, um, you know, in the network and say, like, we're watching you. This is really important in our decisions about, you know, what health plan and what vendor and what carrier we're going to go. What are your plans in the next six months to, to build up uh, you know, access to healthcare within the network. Um, you know, I think also, you know, telehealth to a degree that you're not currently leveraging telehealth to expand access to behavioral health care. I would, you know, I think that's just um, something that's a really important tool in your toolbox. We did um, a survey, again, the same, you know, a survey of our member companies and 70% of them said that, you um, uh, they use telehealth to expand access to mental health care. So I think that's a really important tool. And again, I'm going to say it again, have your CEO send an employee wide email, you know, just let to, to just address that, that, that issue of, of stigma. Yeah. Yeah. The, the telehealth has really been a game changer, you know, during the, the pandemic um, and has been um, you know, really in many cases, life-saving for particularly rural and underserved communities. I mean, the only the only caution is that you know, from while for some that could replace an in-person uh, visit uh, for some types of services that doesn't work, or there may be a you know a preference um, you know for employees of their family members to see someone in person. So you know, we can't uh, we have to make sure that the network is adequate. For the in-person, you know, where that's possible, particularly in more urban and you know, in kind of not the uh, uh, rural areas, um, but uh, you know, so both are important. But definitely, telehealth has been a major, uh, a major silver lining uh, of the entire pandemic. Absolutely. And um, I want to emphasize um, Alan Nesman, who is on the staff here at APA, pointed out how helpful it is to have anonymous complaint channels so that employees uh, can uh, raise flags if they're having trouble getting access. And, you know, I think of this as if I were an employer and my employee, you know, was injured, you know, got hit by a bus and couldn't get care at the emergency room, I would want to know that that wasn't working. Right. And just like that, as an employer, I would want to know if my employees aren't getting what they need. Um, yeah. And, and Another just, question that's, oh, go ahead, David. Oh, sorry. I, you know, just because you mentioned emergency care, um, you know, there is, um, 
you just recently, um, you know, the United States has created a new three-digit uh, suicide prevention and mental health crisis hotline, 988. And there are services uh, that surround 988 for people who need in-person uh, you know, crisis or emergency behavioral health services. Um, those are being covered by, uh, by Medicaid um, you know, programs uh, across the country. By and large, commercial insurers are not covering uh, behavioral health crisis services, so not covering those emergency services, um, which you know, bring, raises an important parity question, whether or not it's under the, the provisions of the Federal Parity Act, we think they are, but you know, should employers be looking at making sure that those uh, behavioral health emergency services um, you know, are covered benefits? Because um, you know, mental health and addiction services you know, know no bounds in terms of socioeconomic uh, you know, uh, you know, class or you know, community. So you know, these services can be important, um, you know, regardless uh, of you know what type of uh, employee uh, you know it, it may be. So um, you know, it's areas like that where I think informed uh, you know employers um, can say, hey, are you covering behavioral health emergency services? And if not, like why not? Um, that asking some of those questions um, you know can really shift. Uh, the conversation and encourage uh, the insurers and the third party administrators um, to make sure that they're you know fully covering uh, needed services. Absolutely. No, I'm so glad you brought that up. And that's also just a great point for awareness in general is to continue for folks to continue raising awareness about 988. Um, that is still a pretty new uh, feature. And uh, I know there's a lot of work being done to get the word out, out about it. Um, another question that we touched on a little bit, but uh, is the around the issue of accountability? Do we expect to see more enforcement or more accountability coming down um, from the Department of Labor? Um, there was a recently a new provision that got passed by Congress around um, small government organizations have less ability to opt out um, of providing coverage. Uh, can you just touch on that a little bit? Uh, sh sure, happy to. Yeah, I think this will continue to be a priority by both state and federal regulators. Um, you know, in terms of make, ensuring compliance with the Federal Parity Act. Um, and, you know, ultimately, though, you know, we, uh, my, my strong preference is not to have this be a punitive process where we're enforcing the laws after, you know, after the fact. Um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, compliance occurs up front and that all Americans have access to the benefit, you know, to mental health and addiction benefits, uh, you know, when they need them. So, um, you know, I think it'll continue to be a conversation uh, you know, but uh, certainly where parity isn't occurring, uh, you know, the Kennedy Forum wants those laws aggressively enforced. Um, with regard to um, their, the other question about, regarding what's called the opt-out, um, state and local uh, government plans have the ability uh, to opt out of the Federal Parity Act. Simply, they just filed something with the federal government and the Parity Act uh, didn't apply and they didn't have to follow the parity rules. Uh, roughly 230 plans uh, nationwide are currently opted out. Congress just eliminated the opt out at the end of last year. So those plans, the vast, vast majority of those plans are now in their final plan year in which they can opt out. Um, and once uh, once their opt out ends for the current plan year, they'll have to comply with the parity rules and uh, we'll have to complete all the parity compliance analyses to demonstrate compliance. So we think it's a major step forward. Um, there are entire other types of health coverage, though, like fee-for-service Medicaid, Medicare, that aren't subject to the Federal Parity Act and really need to be. There's no excuse for these rules, these fundamental rules not applying. And so that will certainly be uh, a point uh, that uh, will be, uh, you know, advocates will be continuing to push uh, for change at the federal level. Thank you so much. And David, wanted to, uh, we're getting a couple of questions in the chat, and at least you could address this as well. Um, how is 988 doing in terms of being available across the United States? I know it is active, um, and I know that uh, it is being implemented at the local level. So can you talk a little bit just real quick about the availability of 988 and how that's going? I'm happy to jump in, at least if, it's, um, um, if that's helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, there've been there's been a dramatic increase in in call volumes, um, you know, with the three digit hotline as opposed to the ten digit uh, number, um, and I think that both reflects increased need, um, you know, over the last couple 
uh, years, particularly among youth, um, but really across all populations. Um, uh, but also, they, it's much easier to remember a three-digit number as opposed to a ten-digit number, which is uh, the point to have, uh, you know, a very easy to remember number like, uh, you know, like nine one one, but for uh, behavioral health, so nine eight eight. Um, you, the that's one component. Uh, states need to uh, ensure that call centers are appropriately funded so that uh, no one has to wait to have a call answered. They can do that through. Um, the resources coming down from the federal government, frankly, not enough. Um, states can use their own resources, either uh, from the general revenue funds, um, or they also have the ability uh, to put in place a funding structure like for 911 uh, through uh, a, a, a small fee on uh, you know, telecommunications uh, lines, which is the, uh, one of the primary funding mechanisms for 911. There's uh, Congress has authorized a 988 fee. So a number of states have begun putting th these small fees in place to fund uh, call centers. Um, as I suggested earlier, um, you know the the services to surround 988. Um, honestly, like for a commercially insured individual, those should not be paid for by taxpayers. Those should be paid for um, by health plans, just like uh, physical health emergency services. Uh, are. So that is uh, will be a push across the nation. A number of states are putting in place you know, those requirements, and ultimately, you know, the the increased expense of funding these services ultimately saves money um, because where people end up when they don't have crisis services or in emergency departments uh, and inpatient facilities, uh, and in some instances, people end up uh, incarcerated inappropriately. Um, it's also a leading cause of uh, police shootings. Um, you know, are people having mental health crises? So, um, you know, there are definitely savings uh, that are very important by paying for crisis services um, that people need upfront, rather than having very costly uh, and you know, often too often tragic outcomes uh, that happen when people don't get these services. Um, and Elise, we've had another question come in. I think you mentioned earlier uh, how some employees or employers are providing access to mental health first aid training for managers or programs like that. We may not have time to get into this too deeply as we're running close on time, but um, we can certainly send out some links to our audience afterward. Are there good low cost training options for supervisors that you um, that you can recommend or share with us? You know, I, I think that there's um, a host of vendors that, um, you know, that are sort of in this space that some of our um, employers have turned to. I think they know that they, need, you know, they want to be saying the right thing. So it's really important to have a high quality um, vendor who really understands, you know, what they're what they're saying. And I think that they have found that, um, you know, it's a way to get a better bang for your buck, if you will, that if, you know, you have someone who can come in and, um, you know, and, and train. And sometimes I think it may be um, embedded with some other training that they're doing, um, you know, supervisor training or, you know, or HR training. But, you know, I will, you know, Terry, I can, I can send you, we have something called our, our silver linings playbook, which is a playbook of some of the strategies that employers use during the pandemic. And a big focus of that was expanding access to, to, um, to, to mental health care. Fantastic. Well, we're running uh, close to the end of our time. Um, wanted to just turn back to both of you real quick. Do you have any other final thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with the audience? David? Uh, you know, just to reiterate, employers play a critical role um, in you know, helping their employees and their family members access uh, you know, mental health and addiction benefits, uh, given that so much of health coverage uh, in the United States is through employer-sponsored plans. In fact, I think it's more than 136 million Americans are in uh, ERISA plans. So the private 176. 77. Okay, okay. <laughs> According uh, to the only, census. I was yeah. only off. I, uh, yeah. Um, but uh, um, thank you, Elise. Uh, <laughs> just to show you like what an essential part of the equation um, employers are uh, in terms of ensuring uh, access to mental health and addiction coverage. Annalise, any just final words uh, for our audience? I, I would just reiterate, I think that's the most important takeaway here is that employers really do play a critical role in, in combating the mental health crisis. And 
Um, you know, their efforts, uh, I think their their efforts focus maybe, you know, short term, medium term and, and long term. And I think we really, I think playing a role in really looking at sort of the, the longer term challenges to building and, you know, a, a mental health and behavioral health provider network um, access um, and workforce is, is just critical. Absolutely. Uh, well, at this time, I just want to thank everyone for being here and for joining us for this webinar, um, making your priority uh, that making your employees mental health a priority so important, like David said, literally just has ripple effects all across this nation. Um, stay tuned to, uh, for more webinars coming from the CEO's Advancing Health Equity Group. We are working on new resources. We will also make sure to send out the recording of this webinar in the next few days, along with some resources that were mentioned so that we can uh, keep everyone in the loop with new information and ways that they can make a difference for their employees. Thank you all very much for joining. Okay. And thank, thank you, you, David and Elise, so much for Bye -bye. being here. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.